today with a few words about my House counterpart, Speaker Kevin McCarthy. Shepherding an institution like the House of Representatives, every bit as stubborn and diverse as the nation it represents is a tall order. Getting a slim majority pointed in the same direction at any one time can seem like nothing short of a miracle. I've said before that uh, in reference to my own position, that being the leader of your party in the Senate is much like being a groundskeeper at a cemetery. Everybody's under you, but no one's listening. Of course, I doubt that Kevin McCarthy has ever seen himself as above anyone else. Not the son of a firefighter, not the grandson of immigrants who stood up his own small business and worked his way through school. From the beginning of the Speaker's House career, it was clear to anyone paying any attention that he was a doer in the model of Teddy Roosevelt's man in the arena and an idealist in the model of his fellow Californian, Ronald Reagan. Congressman McCarthy didn't shy away from worthwhile fights. In fact, he usually dove in head first. He didn't hesitate to get his hands dirty. When the circumstances were tough, he drew on his faith, his family, and his belief in American exceptionalism. His Bakersfield roots kept him grounded. And his beloved mother kept him appraised of kitchen table concerns with frequent calls about the price of gas. In other words, he had all the qualities of an effective representative and speaker. And I'm not sure anyone could have predicted just how much these qualities would come in handy over the past nine months. Speaker McCarthy took office with a commitment to America. He insisted on restoring regular order. He made sure that the People's House was once again open to the American people. And he took on the gravest challenge, a looming debt crisis with single-minded determination. The Speaker and I worked closely throughout his tenure but I was particularly struck by his persistence. He literally willed the President of the United States to the negotiating table and kept coming back again and again until he had helped secure the nation's full faith and credit. Speaker McCarthy was a partner I could trust to be honest and candid and without fail, optimistic. I'm grateful for the enthusiasm he brought to our shared work and for the patriotic, conservative convictions he wears on his sleeve. Perhaps the most telling thing about this week's events in the House has been the way the Speaker handled them, with grace and with gratitude. Speaker McCarthy should be proud of what he and his team have accomplished on behalf of the American people over the past nine months. And he can rest assured that his colleagues, myself included, will continue to draw on his talents and optimism in the days that lie ahead. I'm expressing on an entirely different matter. I spoke yesterday about the list of urgent and unfinished business 
Congress has to address in the coming weeks. We'll start with resuming our work on full-year appropriations to invest in critical infrastructure, take care of America's farmers, and continue modernizing our military to contend with adversaries like China. But we'll also need to make progress on supplemental resources for safeguarding America's direct interest in Ukraine's defense, for helping communities pick up the pieces after natural disasters, for restoring security and sanity to our southern border and to the streets of our cities. The nation is watching closely for progress on each of these priorities. And in the meantime, they're continuing to face the painful reality of Washington Democrats' historic inflation. Across the country, working families continue to report that soaring prices are their top concern. Among workers and small business owners alike, just 28% of Americans say they're satisfied with the state of the economy, and 59% disapprove of the president's policies behind it. Working Americans watched Washington Democrats pour trillions of taxpayer dollars into a wish list of liberal spending, driving up the prices of everything from groceries to housing. To watch the president's war on abundant American energy sent send home heating and gas prices literally through the roof. Meanwhile, the wave of violent crime I spoke about yesterday isn't just terrorizing citizens. It's shutting down Main Street businesses. According to one recent retail industry survey, increased violence makes it harder for retail stores to maintain inventory and inhibits hiring and staff retention. Across the country, 45% of retailers are reporting that they've reduced store opening hours in response, and 28% have had to close stores outright. Of course, these nightmares come on top of the thicket of Biden administration red tape that's already made it as hard as ever to create and sustain a business here in America. So, Mr. President, this is Bidenomics in action. In the past week, a flurry of headlines have reported that even Democrats are beginning to worry that the president's decision to put his personal brand on this latest economy is turning out to be a political misstep. Well, it's a good thing they're finally recognizing what working Americans have known for almost three years now. 